My name is Catherine. I'm 17 and a senior at an all-girls Catholic high school. I'm in my final days now, ready to start on my next adventure, college. I'll be attending The Ohio State University, majoring in biochemistry on a pre-med track. While I'm still in the minority as a young woman and a STEM major, there's been a lot of social change over just the last few decades that have opened up the road to becoming a female physician. In fact, 2017 was the first year that more women than men enrolled in medical school. But here's the thing, there's still a distinct health gap for women. But now the issue isn't on the white coat side. The issue I'm talking about involves the patients. We aren't getting the diagnoses we need when we need them. I mentioned this in my high school social justice class and the other girls were notably fiery about it. But there wasn't time for us to discuss every minor issue in social justice. Yes, it's clearly less broad than racism or immigration issues, but it matters. Women are unnecessarily dying for it. The BBC reports that between 40,000 and 80,000 women in the US alone die each year because of diagnostic errors. Research shows that implicit bias can and does heavily contribute to disparities in medical treatment. A study in 2015 showed that it takes significantly longer for women to be diagnosed with many types of cancer. The tests for diagnosing are often quite simple. It's just a question of getting those tests ordered by the physician. Misdiagnoses for women go back as far as modern medicine does. And the pseudoscience behind the history is weird, to say the least. Up through the mid 20th century, women were often diagnosed as having hysteria when complaining of medical issues. In our post Freudian world, that's basically the doctor saying it's all in your head. But before that, it was a physiological diagnosis, not a psychological one. Historically, people, including trained anatomists and physicians, were mystified by the uterus. Many ailments in women were thus attributed to it directly, particularly the idea that the uterus wandered, and thus the diagnosis of hysteria was born. Despite the seemingly wild history, this is still totally a thing. Women's symptoms are declared to be in their own mind all the time, and real issues are dismissed by trained physicians. Medical News Today says that the top three issues underdiagnosed in women are endometriosis, coronary heart disease, and ADHD. I have ADHD and was lucky enough to be diagnosed at age six, likely because I am the inattentive type who will not only wander in her mind, but also physically. So yes, I was a lucky one, but many other girls and women never get this diagnosis, which holds them back from their true potential. Then we back up to coronary heart disease. Last I checked, heart disease is the number one cause of death in the US. So not getting diagnosed is a major issue. The reason women aren't getting this crucial diagnosis is painfully simple. Doctors only look for the symptoms of coronary heart disease, which are common in men, while the symptoms that appear in women are different. This is where the issue expands beyond the treatment and back into the research behind it. The vast majority of research is on men. And if we don't study women's bodies, how can we expect accurate treatment? This leaves one more top undiagnosed medical issue not covered, endometriosis. For those who aren't as familiar, endometriosis is a chronic, progressive, and currently incurable condition where the tissue that usually only lines the inside of the uterus forms other places as well. Outside of the uterus and the pelvic cavity, along the edges of the kidneys, outside of the fallopian tubes, etc. Which is honestly terrifying. It leads to women feeling intense pain, especially while menstruating, and they can experience heavy periods, chronic fatigue, and a medley of other problems. These undiagnosed women are in debilitating pain without answers. Here's where my anger with the situation gets personal. When I was five, I fell and hit my nose, which proceeded to bleed for three days. My parents, obviously concerned, took me to the doctor, and I was told for the first time in my life, it's probably fine. This steadily became the mantra of my life for bleeding, and by the time I got my period at 13, I didn't need a doctor to tell it to me. I struggled to balance my life and my bleeding, not even realizing it was something I shouldn't have had to balance. My periods were 10 to 12 days of agony, bleeding through both a tampon and a maxi pad, then my clothes in 45 minutes or less, setting alarms to wake up every two hours at night, changing my sheets at 4 a.m., curling up in a ball and crying from cramps that only got worse with Advil, using two boxes of feminine hygiene products a month, the ones that were advertised as over a three month supply. Not pictured here, two minutes later, I was curled up in a ball from cramps so bad I couldn't walk myself into Christmas Eve mass. Not pictured here, I had snuck out of French class earlier that day to switch into my backup skirt because I had bled through the first one. The amount of blood I was losing each month was causing my nutrient levels to plummet, leaving me exhausted no matter how much sleep I managed to get. But 
it wasn't just my numbers that fell so sharply. My grades and self-image did as well. I blamed myself for my bleeding, which culminated into self-hatred and disgust. I was too tired to do good schoolwork, and was often focused on managing my bleeding rather than learning in class. The physical exhaustion left me with little energy mentally as well, which allowed my dyslexia and ADD to run wild. My chronic anxiety was triggered and I was diagnosed with generalized depression by freshman year, and I became more and more aloof from the world. Sophomore year, the nosebleeds started, and after being declared a biological hazard due to the amount of blood pouring from my face, I was shipped off to the nurse's office to wait out my three-hour episodes. She told me, you need to go to the emergency room. I said, it's probably fine. As a compromise, she called my parents and recommended getting me tested at least for iron deficiency, if nothing else. I was taken into the doctor once again with complaints of profuse bleeding, but no tests were ordered. I was told the nosebleeds were from allergies and the amount of blood was all in my head, an exaggeration. Three months later, my mother brought me back to the doctor and demanded tests, refusing to take no for an answer, as I fell asleep at the dinner table despite a light class load and plenty of sleep. They thought I had mono, based on the fact that my sister's boyfriend had recently gotten over it, and he was often at our house in that time. But agreed to test for iron while they were taking labs anyway, and threw in a Von Willebrand's test as a formality. The mono test was negative. My iron was at a three, safe as 20 to 200, and I was awarded a shiny new diagnosis of Von Willebrand's type one, a disease I hadn't even known existed, and I could have died because of it. VWD, also known as angiohemophilia, is a chronic genetic bleeding disorder in the hemophilia family. Think the royal family particularly the little Russian prince with hemophilia B. It means a severe shortage of the von Willebrand factor, which signals the body to clot. So I am virtually unable to clot, and when I can, they are too small to do any good. Like endometriosis, it is incurable, but it is treatable. At 15 and a half, I became a patient at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Blood and Cancer Unit. They surprised me when they reported that my body was shutting down. After almost two and a half years of treatment, including iron supplements, intravenous iron treatment, synthetic factor, and the ultimate decision to stop my now month-long periods for the next five years, I will confidently say that being diagnosed with hemophilia was one of the best things that has ever happened to me. My quality of life has skyrocketed. I'm now graduating with honors, having received straight A's since sophomore year. I have a loving group of friends, and my mental illnesses have lessened their hold without the stress of managing a serious bleeding disorder I didn't even know I had. So, yes, getting diagnosed with hemophilia was one of the best things that has ever happened to me. So, why did it take so long for me to get it? In my opinion, this is a major social justice issue with a relatively easy fix. Change the way research is done, change the way medical school students are trained. It's a question of dignity. All people have an inherent right to medical care, but what about the women who are receiving medical care that proves inadequate? It is a question of social change. It needs to be systemic be the ones who demand thorough checks and careful diagnoses. Go out and become an advocate for yourself and others. Remember, you could be saving a life like that.